Hi, how are you doing? Hello, how are you doing? Hello. Hi, Ryan. I hope you're doing good. Doing okay. Good. Hi, Jose. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Hi, Manny. So we are going to do unit three today. We have a couple minutes before we're going to get started. Um, go ahead and download the notes. Possibly look at the PowerPoint too, if you like, and um, the assignments for today. So check out notes, assignments, and if you like, you can download the PowerPoint from Canvas, okay? And then we'll start in about one minute. And then we'll wait for everybody to get on. So this week we're gonna dive into a little bit more into LC3 and talk about the architecture folder. Um, please preview the notes before we start in about a minute. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I think some people will join us. So, Welcome back. Uh, we are in week three for assembly programming uh, organizational architecture. We are going to go in depth a little bit with the architecture and looking at LC3 instructions a little further. Last week you did the lab where you were able to output string, do some ASCII conversion in the last lab. So if you missed the last lab, uh, please make sure you dedicate time to go through the exercises. This week, we're going to get a little bit more into the arithmetic side of the house where we're going to look at mathematical expressions and how to interpret that with assembly LC3 language. So um, I'm going to get into screen share. And also, I posted an announcement for um, a job that's opening. I wanted to clarify where you can find it. Um, I make Innovation Center, AKA Makerspace, is looking for student aid to ask some of the students are graduating. I think the position pays roughly about $13 an hour. Um, you will be working with 3D printer. They have one of the best 3D printer we, they can do printing for, you know, things that you can use regularly, not just, you know, so they have like these really great 3D printers, the small ones and the big ones. You can learn how to use laser cutter. And then we work with programming projects. Um, I'm doing a project for clean water, uh, which I posted for extra credit. So if you're interested, you can attend those. We're partnering with a school in Iraq to deliver some um, solutions for clean water in our local community. And we're gonna use Tinkercad to design objects, uh, water filter for from 3D printer. And then we are gonna use Arduino to program um, sensors for clean water reservoir. Um, it won't, we won't be able to get through the five weeks with the entire project, but I hope to pick it up after that. So if you're interested, you can check out the extra credit um, module. 
And if you're interested in this job, uh, it's a part-time position through the student A2. So if you click the link, you will find the job listed under student employment. And then it's listed under, let me see, English tutorial services. Huh. They would have it here. Let me double check with them, but it would be under this category. As you can see, we also have additional positions that's listed for the district and also MBC. So let me find out if this is going to be the outreach. But you will find a job listing there and to apply for the job, you will need resume, cover letter, um, and letter of recommendation. If you need me to write a letter of recommendation, if you were in my classes before, please send me an email. Um, you can use the letter of recommendation for any jobs or any applications, including transfer applications or university applications. Um, usually I would write a letter of recommendation for students that had taken my classes. So if you're interested in that and you're getting a good grade, like email me and let me know, okay? So you need two letter of recommendations to apply for these jobs and the link is provided under the announcement. Okay, I will clarify with Jason, who is the manager at I Make Innovation Center tomorrow to make sure that the job is listed and posted under a certain category. I will follow up on Thursday. So for this week, we are gonna go through unit three and you can find the notes which cover chapter four in the text. I will post the lecture video for today after the session. We will complete an in-class assignment. Basically, we're just gonna go through some of the concept and answer the questions. I wanted to clarify some opcodes and so that way we'll be prepared for the lab this week. Um, and our labs, we are gonna work with numbers this week. So we are gonna look a little further into what we had left off with the ASCII conversion. And we did a little bit of addition uh, after we can ask you convert it. So I'll talk a little bit more about the structure of the instructions today, and hopefully that give you a clearer picture. And then we will come back to last week lab on Thursday and touch on the areas that you were having con confusion on or the things, questions that you had from the last lab and going into the next lab. So in this week, um, to start off before I get into the notes, there's a PowerPoint presentation that gives you a little bit detail about the history of computing, um, starting with how, well, how the computer is created and what it was used for. So in general, historically, when you look at some of the systems that were documented and well-known, um, we started out with building computers to process arithmetic calculations. The computer was used for counting. Basically, it's used for very simple calculation. Um, and the processor has transformed over time. We talked about you know, how logic was implemented for the later processors and what that came about with the actual architecture with the logic gates last week. So in this week, we're gonna focus on the actual components inside the processor. But when you look at the historical system, you would see that it was used for encryption or cryptography. It was used for some design. A lot of it was used for government purposes. And um, the earlier system, this is known as the ABC, and uh, it, if you go to some computer museum, you will find the replica model of this, especially the one in Washington, DC or at the Iowa State University. Um, so in this particular system, this is when binary numbers were implemented. It was mainly used with electronic switch and it was not fully functional as far as the programming aspect. It was used to solve some of the linear equations. So as you can see, we needed the computing system for a lot of the mathematical processing. Um, and this was from 1937 to 1942. 
the reason why I'm showing this is the, the, the constructions or the design in computing hasn't changed too much um, from earlier times. We have improved the technology, but the architecture still have some of the basic components that's what we see today. And the Zeus Z3 was designed in Germany. This was used for floating points. And this is when we started implementing what we know as human as decimal or in the system that would be floating points. Um, there was no conditional branching that, that could be applied. So we're gonna talk about conditional branching and flow in the program today. And it was not fully programmable again. So the original system was destroyed, but they had rebuilt the replica and was used and is currently used in museums. And some of you probably heard of the Colossus and this was implemented for binary numbers, also electronic switching. So transition from what we've seen with some of the earlier design. And this particular system, it, the size of it is like a large warehouse, it's big. Um, and it was used for crypto analysis. So to really translate encryption, um, the German encryption codes. So the system or the original system was destroyed in World War II and not until the seventies is when we found, we really publicly know about the system. And IBM and some of the well-known university had teamed together, Howard Eichen designed a system in 1940. So, the late 30s and the 40s was the era that, that we really picked up in, in designing and creating the computing system in which was carried on until today, right? So our current technology has the implementation from the historical systems, and then we continue to redesign the actual processor and the component for our system. So this one uses decimal number, which is the base 10. Um, and then it has electrical mechanical shafts, clutches and gears. And it, it is programming, we, we were able to program it with paper tape, which later on they implemented punch cards for the later system. So at this time with this system, we were able to implement loops or conditional branching in our processor. Um, not fully programmable. And so now the recognition for Eigen was later contributed. Um, and, it, you know, so some of the earlier system, as you can see, was not clear um, and was not fully documented until a later time. And if you visit the ENYAC web website, you would find that, you know, uh, John Mockley and, and, and Prosper Eckert in, in 1944, 1944 through 1946, designed a system that uses decimal values. And the processor for this, uh, so the way that the actual size of the system is a large room, it's programmable, but it doesn't have all the extension for the programmable capability. Um, and so this was considered to be the first electronic computer fully. The other ones were more electronic components that were put together for different functionality. Now in comparison, you would see the chart on the following slide. And this kind of give you the overall main historical systems on what, it, what type of numbers it's using, that the, whether it's electronic or not, is it programmable or not? And the Harvard Mark I was the first one that used the punch paper tape. So von Neumann is who we're gonna talk about today. And I call him the grandfather of computing. Um, the model that he created is being used today in our processor. So in 1944 through 1946, um, von Neumann built the system which later known as EDSAC. And so in the following, they redesign and they also release the EDSAC II. Uh, it was mainly used for military calculations and also for mathematical purposes. 
Now, he was the one of the first found father that really, the, the grandfather of computing that really implemented what we see today with memory and the components in processing, ACU and CU, okay? Control unit and arithmetic unit. So now there's some repercussions and it talks about this, um, but if you're interested, I have a different slide that I created, um, but that would just go more into the historical systems and what the type of components. So we're gonna touch some of that today on some of that today in our lecture. Um, and this kind of lead the way from what we see with the mini computers, with the microprocessors, with the Apple systems that, that came and the IBM systems and the PC, and now is what we're using in transition and the transformation of the technology. So the first set of slide kind of talk about the computing history. The second set of slide is what was translated and put onto the notes. So I'm gonna use the notes for most part, but you can see the details on the slides there. So in chapter four, it begins with talking about computer program. And many of you are learning or have learned programming languages. You would create small or large program depending on the goal. Um, but the computer program is just a set of instructions and for us, the majority of the time we would use higher programming languages like C++, Java, Python, et cetera. Um, now in the assembly level, we would see how these instructions would be utilized by the processor and how it would have movement across different components in the processor. So the computer program is simply a set of instructions, each specifying a well-defined piece of work for the computer to carry out. Therefore, we would have functions in our program to complete specific tasks, right? Like in, in C++, you can prototype and define your functions, or in Python, you simply use def to define your function, um, and then call your functions in the main or at the bottom of your program, which is the area for main in Python to be able to execute certain tasks. Now instructions are simply a smallest piece of work that's specified by the computer program. And in the last few weeks, we talk about work for the computer is simply adding. So it would take what you had specified as instructions and apply, right? Either arithmetic or logic. So that way it can process the task. And we will look at the steps in, in how the processor would work. So John von Neumann proposed the fundamental model of the computer that was implemented and still being used today. So for the test quiz and also general knowledge in computer science, you need to know this. The von Neumann model consists of five parts. We need to store information somewhere and especially with instruction. So that would be the memory. And before we would see RAM, right? If you look back into the history of computing, the, the, the storage inside the processor was considered to be more primary. Now, later on, they implemented RAM, and then we would then have larger storage devices like hard drive, solid state drive, et cetera. But the processor itself needs a location where it would be able to store the instructions, store data. And when we work with LC3, on the left column, you would see the addresses that would represent an array of memory, okay? So the first part of the model is the memory. Then we would have a processing unit and that would be represented as a CPU. Now the CPU, within the CPU, you would have different components. 
you will have a control unit which coordinates, right, uh, different activities that's going on in the processor. And then you would have an arithmetic logic unit that would be able to operate for logic and calculation. But the computer itself, outside of the two main parts, it needs to have a way to interact with the human. So it needs to have an input device. And for our input devices, that would be keyboard, mouse, touchscreen nowadays, right? Um, microphone to be able to obtain voice, and then output devices, screen that would be able to display text, speaker that's able to display sound, printer that's able to print out the text or images from your system. So the two components, the two parts that's following the processing unit in the memory was really designed or in incorporated for the, the interface with the human. And then the control unit is going to be coordinating tasks. So in the image that's provided, it gives you a little bit of example of input and output. And the processing unit, we would have a temporary location. And in LC3, we would see this with your registers. And then we'll dive more into the IR and the PC. With the memory, we would also have locations where we would be able to dedicate that for specific label, specific area that would store some kind of, it could be an array of, of, um, of memory locations that we would be able to store larger data sets. So here in this image, it shows you on how all of these components are working together and with the control unit, it mainly used the IR and the PC to coordinate the task. So in your questions, for number one, it asks you to describe the components and functions of von Neumann model machine, okay? So we can say that memory is gonna be used to store for storage. Your processing unit, and if you refer to this or the, the presentation, that's fine. Here it tells you each of the areas. So contains instruction and data, performs arithmetic and logical instructions in the processing unit. Control units is gonna be used to interpret instructions Input is used to transfer data into the memory, and then output is used to transfer data from the memory to the device. So instead of retyping that, I can go ahead and copy and paste that here. Let me fix this real quick. Any questions? Okay. So before we get into the next question, which is number two, let's touch on some of the things about memory. So for many of us, when we think about memory, we think about RAM, right? Um, and there are different types of RAM and RAM stands for random access memory. We touch on this during the first couple of weeks. So when we look at how data is stored, um, we, because it's in binary, we would have two to the power of K or two to the power of N times M to represent the array of stored bits. So when we're looking at 256 meg, which gives you two to the 28th power of the addressable space. And the address would have the identifier for the location. So 
that would refer to the, the, the actual, and a lot of times now in the modern system, we would use hexadecimal to represent an address, a memory address in our system. So it needs to have some kind of unique identifier and for the content, <clears throat> that will be the M bits value that's stored in the location. So when you look at the image that's provided and you think about the lab that you've done last week where we originated for our program, our origination address starts at 3000. <clears throat> so the program will begin there in LC3 and it will continue to utilize, right? The subsequent location from that 3000 hexadecimal value, okay? So in this one, it gives you a, a representation of how that would be when the data is stored. So it's gonna store that in zero and one, and then it would subsequently allocate this. And for our architecture for this class, we're using a word size, which is 16 bits. And we would chunk that into 16 bits. And within that 16 bits, some of the bits, the first four bits are used for opcode, which stores instructions. And so in the memory, it would take that and, and store it as a word size. So it could have numerous words, right? And in each word, it would have some form of instructions and then it could have values or what we see as raw data. So, in for the basic memory operations and some some assembly language would use specific type of instructions but overall it would fall under the category for data movement um, so in in basic memory operations we would have some form of operation for loading and when you look at LC3, that would represent in LDR, LDI, LEA, and LD. And what load does is it's going to read the value from the memory location, place an address of that location into the memory address register, and then interrogate the memory location. So we would use this before the fetch process. Right, so when you do, last week when you did an LEA, what you did was you load effective addresses. So it needs to correlate that address with that string. And when it loads, when you run the program, you also see LD, LD later on in the simulator is because it needs to read the value from the memory location in order to find right, the data that you have stored in specific location. So the information is stored in the location and what it's gonna do with that address is it's gonna take that address and it's gonna put it into a specific register that's called the MDR, which is for memory data register. And it would use this to be able to find the data at a specific location in the memory. Okay, any question? So I'm gonna finish this part and then we will answer the next few questions in our assignments. Um, so the example that we see here is to load a location A. So what it does is gonna write the address A to the memory address register it's gonna send a read signal to the memory, and then it's gonna read the data from the MDR. So MDR's job is for data, right? And MIR job is to, to have to um, record or store that address information. And when it stores is when it writes a value to the memory location. So first it has to load and then it has to read and then it will store. Okay, so let's touch on the next one. 
So if you have a system that has 512 megabyte of memory, what is the maximum address space? So in the, in the notes, it shows you 256 is two to the 28th, then 512 will be two to the 29th, 1024 will be two to the 30th and so forth. So we would use two to the power of N to really represent the size of our memory address allocation. Hey, Professor, that numbers in is that hexadecimal? No, this the address itself is in hexadecimal, but this would be just to represent. So if you do two to the 29th. Right, you would see. So if I have two and raise it to the 29th power, this is the number of addresses that I can allocate out of the 512 megabyte. Okay. Now, if you have less like 256 megabyte, right? So this is not an, a hexadecimal value, right? This is just a size of our memory. Let's say if you're looking at RAM or an application that requires RAM, then the reason why the application requires RAM, now you think about that, is because it needs to allocate address for to in order to execute some of the processes in your program, right? If you install software, it tells you this is the, the amount of RAM that you would need, right? 512, 256 meg. It's really coming back to address allocation, the number of addresses that it needs to use for that application, for that software. So when we're looking at 256, so that we said that it's two to the power of, oops, two to the power of 28, right? So with, with, Two to the 28th, we have approximately this many, we have this many addresses that we can allocate for that storage, okay? So the 1024 one would just be two to the 30? Yes. And you, based on that, we can see how many addresses we can, we can use for that particular memory size um, my original question was on um, the number like the power how do we get to that right here yeah okay so for <coughs> sorry going back to what we talk about here right and also last week um or the first week now, because data is stored in binary, so you know it's gonna be a base two, okay? And when you're looking at the equivalence in the decimal scale, then when, remember we do a multiple of two, two times two times four times whatever not. So as you increment that, you would see that when it gets to 256, it will be two to the 28th, based on that the word size is gonna be 16 bits, okay? Now, remember that this is a megabyte and a byte is eight bits, okay? So for the 256 megabyte, we would be, if you convert that, that would be right here, okay? So that would be two, 268 million addressable space, okay? So this K right here just represents each of the location, right? For the array, M array for the store bits. Now, when you go to, to the 24, uh, to, to the 29th, that will be a much higher value because our size has increased. It's double that, right? 512 is 
higher than 256. You would take 256 times two, which we move into the next, the, the, the next value. So 512 would be double this amount. So you should expect that your addressable space is gonna be twice as much as 256. And 1024 is gonna be twice as much as 512 and so forth. So when you're looking at RAM on how you use your RAM for applications, right? In, in some applications, it requires a lot of RAM. For example, like when I run virtual machines to test uh, stuff for security and networking classes, it requires like at least a gig or two gigs of RAM. And because it's able to, it, because the application, the hypervisor itself, utilize a larger array of addresses for to be able to execute for that particular virtual machine. Okay. So now um, when we're looking at the describe basic the operations in memory and you can add more to it. The assignments are designed to help you put notes so that way you remember and also you give you something to use for review purposes later. Um, in the basic operation for memory, as we mentioned, it's gonna load and store. And those are the two main operations for memory, okay? So when we look at application today um, from a standpoint of whether you're gonna go into computer engineer or even you know, development, like becoming a programmer or developer, when you write your application, you have to really think about how, how memory is being utilized in that, right? What kind of processes that you would have and what kind of resources that you should dedicate to that particular process or a group of processes in your application. And that comes back to your, the resources would come back to memory. And as I mentioned before, right, your word length is 16 bits or two bytes. So at, for, for our architecture, ISA, use word length that is 16 bits. Microsoft ASM, also use 16-bit word length. But if you program ARM64, word length is 64-bit. So on the more modern architecture, the more modern processor that you see today for smartphones, right, that's produced by different company like Qualcomm, et cetera, their word length is larger, okay? And so we're, and, and with that, we're able to build application that utilize memory space that would be in a larger array with the larger word length. So for LC3, remember that it's 16 bits word length. And we're gonna visualize that when we look at the opcode. Any question? So the process would, let me move this down for, for storing. We mentioned that it would write the address of the memory location to MER, then the value would be stored in the MDR. So the MDR, its job is just for data. The MER is for address, remember that, okay? It interrogate the memory and write enable signal inserted so that way it would flag it as stored and the information contained in an MDR will be written to the memory location whose address is in the MAR. So the MAR keeps a record of the address and then the MDR would be used for data. And as the data is written to the location, it would, the MAR would contain that address. So it would move that address into the MAR, okay? So think of an MAR as like, I don't know, maybe you too young, but it, it's like a, a white page or a list of addresses in the home of all the homes, okay? 
and as the person enter the home and live there, right, it's going to take that address and put it on the MAR, right, the person is data. So when the data is stored at a location, it's going to take that and put it on the MAR for record. And it's going to use that for, for references because in your program, you would be able to take, retrieve that data for different things. So if we think about a C++ program, we would declare a variable, we assign it a value. So at that point, what it's going to do is it's going to do what? It's going to pin the variable to an address. It's going to take that address and put it on the MAR. And, and because we assign the value, that's data, OK? And when it's going to store that data to that location, and that, that address is then recorded on a list. So here's the below is just an example. If we write the x as a value to a location A and write the data x, it needs the MDR to do the data. So it write the data to the MDR first which is attempt, it's a register. And then it writes the address A to the MAR, and then it, it sends the right signal to the memory. Any question with load and store? So we have to think about the manual process to really be clear on what's happening at the assembly level, right? So we have to really know all of the functionality within the processor going forward. Next, we're gonna talk about the processing unit, which is your processor. So in the processing unit, we know that there is an arithmetic logic unit, which is the ALU. And the ALU is going to utilize the word length for us. That will be 16 bits. So for ISA, it's, it, each ISA model has its own word length. Like I said, for the new ARM64, it has a higher word length, depending on the intention of that system, the goal. So for the complex calculation, you would see that the processor would utilize higher word length. So in this class, we're using 16-bit word length. And some processor also use 32-bit word length. Okay. So that really where we would be able to find the answer for number four. Now, when we work with registers like R0, you saw that last time and R0 is in charge. It's, it's you know, for input, it's dedicated for LEA, et cetera. Okay, so it's correlated with a certain type of instruction. But register itself, the general register that we can use in LC3 is R0 through R7. And basically, they are temporary storage inside the processor. They are in charge of operands and results of functional units. So when we do an add, like last time you saw we did an add, we basically use the register to temporary store, right? some value. It could be immediate value like hexadecimal or decimal values, or we can use it to store, to copy from one register to another, the data from another register. So LC3 has eight registers, general purpose registers. Uh, some other assembly language use different number of registers depending on the architecture. Sometimes you see 14, 
sometime you see 12. So it's best to really refer to the documentation, but LC3 is a good foundation. So learning this is gonna help you understand other assembly languages. It's like learning C or C++ is gonna help you, okay? So to answer the next question, we can refer to that portion of the notes. The functions of the register within the, the system processing unit is it's going to be in charge of operands and results of the functional unit. Any question with registers? So for input and output devices, you saw on the first page, the image of it, <clears throat> of our computing system. And you can think about what device do we need to use for input, right? And so when you do a get C in, a, in LC3, basically it's gonna listen for what the keyboard signal, it's gonna listen for the keyboard signal and wait for the user to enter a value. But at assembly level, you saw last lab that we have to ASCII convert it because for human text, right, it's encoded as ASCII. So we need to convert it to a value. That way the processor would understand that this key is, let's say an A is equivalent to this value. So a keyboard is considered an input. Mouse is also is an input. We won't be using too much of the mouse with LC3, except for just to navigate through and look at our memory addresses to interface a simulator. But as far as the programming, creating a program, it uses a mouse. You don't really have a lot of the, inter the graphical user interface in assembly. Now, some, some of the later assembly languages, you might be able to add stuff through C compiler, right? Uh, you're able to create buttons. I've done that in my other, my, when I first started teaching CIS 11, I used Microsoft ASM and Microsoft ASM uses Visual Studio um, C compiler to compile the program. So it converts it and be able to build it. So in that case, you'll be able to have a drop-down menu, things like that, some graphical user interface components. But at this level, we're just simply doing, we're executing operations and looking at how our program is gonna flow and, and, and the processes behind it using just very simple instruction. So printer, monitor, our output devices, you can put speaker, right? Uh, there are all different types of output devices. So you would hear the term peripherals being used, right? Um, and that would refer to the components for input and output or the devices for input and output. Now, <clears throat> LC3 supports keyboard input. You saw how we would use in or get C, right? Um, and then the monitor for output, we would use, we would use the pseudo instruction with for puts um, to be able to display, right? You saw how we display hello world string last time. But for the keyboard, it uses KBDR and KBSR. We'll come back to this in the next few chapters. So keyboard use data register and status register. And status is simply for it, you know, signal for it to wait and listen, right? And then data register is for value translation, for value to be recorded. And then same thing with the monitor, data register and status register, your DDR and your DSR. And those are registers that are dedicated for these two. And in LC3, we'll only use keyboard and monitor for input and output. 
And some devices with both input and output like disk, network storage, DVD burner, CD burner, um, you know, the all-in-one printer, fax machine scanner, those are both input and output devices. And many of us have dealt with drivers, especially for PC users, right? When you install your operating system or when you plug in a new device, you have to update your driver or install your driver. And drivers are simply program that controls <coughs> device access. So for example, I'm using my Bluetooth headset right now, right? And when I, when I turn it on, the first time I wanted to make sure that I pair it and then my system needs to recognize it. So the driver is a program that allows my operating system or my system to be able to access the device or see the device. And <clears throat> when you look at your smartphone, right? Uh, you're looking at some app that would require camera and head and microphone when it's listening in or you're able to take pictures, um, you know. So with that, they incorporated driver to, and then also certificate with the permissions with that particular app for to access the hardware components on that system. So to answer the next question, we can say that the device driver is a program that controls access to a device. And it could be specific to peripherals or sometime that could be internal, like your network interface card or your wireless adapter for your laptop, your tablet, um, and your network interface card is used for what? Network connection, right? So things could be internal or it could be for peripherals use. Any question? Okay. So now let's look at the control unit. And based on our notes, we see that control units orchestrates execution of the program. So the ALU is for logic and arithmetic. The, the, the CU is to coordinate and orchestrate execution. So internally, this is what's happening inside control unit. It's able to keep track of instructions that is being executed and it uses the IR or the instruction register. So that will contain your instructions. So when the next time when you write your program on Thursday and you say AN R0, R0, 0, right? that instruction is then stored and, and, and be able to, the CU is able to put that into the IR so that way it can understand that is a, you know, the ALU needs to process the logic and it's able to retain that for execution, okay? So it tracks all the instruction through using IR for the current instructions. And it also have the next instruction in place. So that way it would be able to get the next instruction address and execute that, okay? So it keeps track of which instruction is to be processed. That means that it's gonna contain the next instruction address. Now, for this architecture, we use this PC or program counter. And this would be a pointer for instruction because it says that the content in the register is pointing to the next instruction per process. So that way it would be ready for the next instruction. Okay. So for the control unit, 
we can look at some of the details here and make sure that you know the difference between AOU, CU, and the all the five components that we talk about in von Neumann model. Here it provides additional information about the CU. It reads the instruction from memory. The instruction address is in the PC. So once it reads that from the memory, it puts the instruction, the address to the counter, the, the, the PC, the point, and it's going to point. Then it's going to interpret the instructions. And then it's going to tell the component what to do. So when you do a get C, right, the keyboard gets the, put that onto the keyboard register, you, the user type in a letter, it's going to, do that, it's going to transfer that to the data register for the keyboard, the KDC. And then it's going to then be able to, for the next step, the IR is going to contain the address of the instruction for the next execution. It's going to load that address. It's going to generate the signal and then it's going to execute the instruction. So if I tell the, if in my program, if I tell it to do one plus one, from the user input, this is what's happening, right? Keyboard listen, keyboard take data, and then load address, take that address, refer to the instruction, take that instruction, add that value with the register, and then following that, go to the next instruction all, and be able to put it, show that the user type in one, and then do another, the same round again, to be able to add and then have the output. So for each of the instruction, it needs to refer to instruction address and that is in the PC. And an instruction may take the machine cycle and, and in the presentation, it shows the machine cycle. But last week, when we talk about logic, we talk about the clock cycle so for each of the instruction, it will take one machine cycle. Okay, so in the next question, we can simply take what's from the notes, but I just reiterate that here. Control unit components and purposes. So you can simply say that IR contains the current instructions and the CU mainly keeps track of the instructions that are being executed. It keeps track of the next instruction by using a register for the, instruction, the next instruction address. It uses the pointer to point to the next instruction to be processed. Okay. And this is how it managed the processes for your program. Any question? Let me take this to the next page real quick. So you can find this on the notes on page four, okay? Let's talk about instruction processing. So once it has the instruction, the current instruction, let's say that it needs to go through and be able to process the instructions. Now, the program and data are stored in sequence of bits in the memory. So when the program is executed, it's gonna do one instruction at a time under the CU control. 
So the CU is going to orchestrate, right? And it's going to do current instruction. It's going to be able to execute that using IR. And then it uses the PC to point to the next instruction. Once that's done, then it's going to go and load the next instruction in and be able to process that. For LC3, we have three basic categories of instructions. Computational instructions, which are and, add, not, okay? Logic and arithmetic. Data movement instructions, you would have load, store, like earlier we talked about memory, right? Load and store. So you would have things like add, add and and not for the computational. And then you might have load, also known as also LDI. We'll talk about the difference next time. LD, LEA, right? And then we also have STR and LDR. And that is used for data movement. Then we have flow control instructions or control instructions. We would have jump, JMP, BR for branch. You can simply branch or you can simply branch with negative value, BRN, BRZ, and BRP. So we'll get further into this in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so for test exam and the purpose of our lab, we need to know that these are the type of instructions that we'll be working with. Similarly, you're gonna see other languages, uh, other assembly languages use very similar instructions. Okay, they might have more than what you see in LC3, but Basically, it will fall under the three categories. Flow, move data, and compute. So for instruction processing, here are the six steps. First, it's gonna fetch. And then it's going to decode. So fetch instruction from memory. Then it's going to decode the instruction. And then it's going to evaluate the address. Then it's going to fetch the operands from memory. Then it's going to execute and store result. Now, it, the notes included this point, which is important. Not all faces are needed for every instruction. And some would have less faces depending. So you can use this chart or you can type it out, which I did. So step one is to fetch instruction from memory. Stu is to decode instruction. Three is evaluate address. Four is fetch operands from memory. Five is execute operation. And six is to store result. You can find this on page five of the notes. So let's clarify the basic unit of the instruction. Two parts. One is known as the opcode, what the instruction does, the operation to be performed like and, not, or, nor, right? Not, or. So you would have add, etc. 
Okay, so opcode. The operands is who is it to do, do it to, so that will be data. And in this class, sometime when we refer to hexadecimal number or decimal number, their values, then we would say that it, they are immediate values versus offset that will be addresses, okay? So the data, the locations, it could be data values themselves or addresses, locations to be used. And you will see some of that this week when we do the lab. Okay. So after number nine, you would then write down the two essential parts of the instruction processing for number 10, opcode and operands. Opcode used for operations to be performed, operands used for data or address location to be used. Any question with nine or 10? Okay. So the steps that's provided on page five after the, the description of opcode and operands, it talks about how instruction is encoded with a sequence of bits. And that will be a fixed length in our case, 16 bits. The control unit interprets the instructions. It's gonna then generate signals to carry out the operation and it's gonna go into fetch mode, okay? And the operation is either executed or not. So when you look at the ISA architecture instruction set architecture in LC3, this is important. So that way the next time when you write your code, you, you know exactly what's going on, okay? So we are using 16-bit instruction. The four bit is dedicated for the opcode and that's from 12 to 15 in the front here. So when I do an add R0, R0, and then a value, then the front, the four bits in the front here, 15 to 12, remember we, we talked about the how we would represent that, that will be dedicated for the, the instruction. Then the next few bits, that's gonna be dedicated for the destination. Where is that going to? And we would use register, okay? Register, R0, R1, R2, et cetera. Then after that, the next three bits, are gonna be for the source. Where is that coming from? So when I do, when I do an add R0, R0, zero like this, I'm taking the zero and I'm adding it with the value that's in register zero and then put it back into R zero, okay? And I explained some of this in the lab last time. So if R zero originally the source has nothing and we have zero here, basically we do a zero with a zero and then put it into R zero, so at this point, assuming that it has nothing, R0 is gonna contain zero. 
Now you wanted to do a hash zero to do a decimal or an X zero to do a hexadecimal. And it doesn't really matter because zero is zero and equivalent for both type of numbers. Okay. So the destination, remember that it's gonna follow the instruction and then the source where it's coming from, right? Is gonna be after the destination. So uh, what are bits three, four, and five for? So this could be your immediate value. So the, actually, no, this clears it out for flags. And then the source two is for the immediate value. So it uses five. We will talk about this later on when you see more flags with the parenting. So this one doesn't require flags, but in some other instructions, it's actually allocated those for flags. Okay, for like flow with, because when you see, when you do a branch, it checks for negative positive. So that would be the, the flag bit. Now for the add instruction, those are zero out. There's nothing there. Okay. Now this, and keep in mind that we're using 16 bits. So when you look working with like the larger data type, you have to think about how you allocate the sizes. Okay, so when you do an add instruction and next week we will touch more on this, it's gonna be 001. It knows that when it sees this, it's gonna say that that's an add instruction. Okay, 001, 0001. And then for the destination, that will be your registers. So last week when you did your lab and you look at your your, your simulator, remember how when you assemble, you see a binary and a hex file. So if you wanted to look at each of the line in binary, you see that there is the binary for the add. You can look at, you can look at that, okay? So I told you to keep that file so you can see the equivalent of it in hex and in binary, okay? So what the computer sees. So when we do like an add content of R0 to the content of R6 and store the result in R6, if we do it like that, it would be simply add, right? R6, R6, and R2. So where is it coming from? The content of R6 and the content of R2, that's in the back there. And then we, our destination, we're gonna put it, we're gonna store it back into R6. And that's, that's your, that's one of your lines. Okay. Questions? So we'll practice a little bit more in our lab this week and also in the future weeks, okay? All right, going back to number 12, when should control instructions be used? Actually, I'll, I'll come back to this, I'm sorry. We're gonna move forward with this before we get to branching. Okay, let's talk about load. So load instructions can be LD, LDI, LDR, LEA. Next week we'll touch on the differences, but last week you saw how LEA is used. It's load effective address. And for the load instructions, mainly it's gonna read the data from memory. So, we can do, uh, we can have a line like this, an L, LD R0, and we can have it to a label. Let's say label one. 
okay? Or we can also load content. And basically we're moving data from one area to the, the other. So what we're doing here is it, we're telling it to go to a location, label one, get the data and put it onto R0, register zero. Now for the LDR, we can, this is called a direct load, right? And then if you use an LDI, it's an indirect load. And then an LDR, it's gonna refer to just memory location. So LDR uses offset, which is addresses, okay? Or it could be a location, okay? So, the base and the offset mode, what it will do is it's gonna add the offset to the base register, which is gonna be the memory ad address, and it's gonna load the memory address to the destination register. So in this process, first, it's gonna calculate the offset to the base register. So it's gonna do an increment then it's going to put that into the memory address. Once it had that, it's going to take, it's going to load the memory address to the destination register. Okay. So to illustrate that, we would see that here. We would have the instruction destination, the base and the offset. So the example we have here is add the value of six to the content of register three to form a memory address, load the content of that memory to the location of R2. So we would do an, we would do an LDR. Uh, where is that going into? Load, add a value, load the content R2 and then R6 and R3. Okay. So here it shows you how the load instruction works. And with the LDR, you would see that it would be 0110. Okay. Where earlier we talked about add, that will be 0001. Now, some university, they actually give you something like this and you have to know what kind of instruction that is and where is that going to, okay? But for my class, as long as you understand the process behind load, right? How to write that in assembly and the process behind like add and other type of instruction, that is good. Okay. Um, let's talk about fetch. So you saw that the first process or the first step in, the, in processing would be fetch. It's gonna load the next instruction into the address that's stored in PC to IR. It's gonna copy the content of PC. It's gonna use the content of the pointer, copy it to the MAR and MAR and its job is just for addresses, right? And then it's gonna send the read signal to the memory. Then it's gonna copy the content from N MDR, which is for data into the IR. And then it's gonna increment it's gonna do a plus one to the PC where it points to the next instruction. So it will do a PC plus one. So it's gonna drop it down one in that array. Any question with fetch?
So in the next question, it asks about 411, describe how instruction is fetched in instructions processing. Like what we stated, load next instruction from IR, from memory into IR, I'm sorry, then load content from PC to MIR, read signal, then read the content from MDR stored in IR, then it's gonna have an increment in PC that points to the next instruction, which makes it PC plus one. Okay, so make sure we know what's happening with fetch. So once it fetch, then it would decode and that will be the first four bits of the instruction. So a decoder is asserted and that will correspond with your opcode. So it needs to take that and decode it to ones and zeros. Like earlier we saw how add, that would be zero, 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 one. So depending on the opcode and each opcode has a set of binary values that would represent that opcode. And then after that, it's gonna identify operands from the remaining bits, which is represented as destination. And depending on the opcode here, it's gonna use the rest, which could be base and offset in the case of LDR or add, it's gonna be destination and the second source. I'm sorry, yeah, destination source and the second source. So for LDR, the last six bits will be offset. For add, the last three bits would be the second source. So when we do something like add R2 from R1 and R3, so we have first source, second source, destination, and add. So at the decoding stage, it needs to take this, the first four bits, and be able to make sure that it's gonna correspond with the opcode. So 0, 0, 0, 1. And then after that, it's gonna take the operands and decode that, okay? Then the second part will be fetching operands. So it would obtain the source operands which in this case, if we do an add, that will be the first source and the second source from the remaining bits. Okay. So at that point, it would be able to read the data from the register. Then in the execution step, it would perform the operation using the source operand. So when we say add, it's gonna be able to operate the add for those values that's stored in the register. Okay. So that means it's gonna assert the add signal and AOU will be in charge of the calculation at that point. And if you do load and store, it doesn't, really need to execute anything. It's just gonna put the data, the write the data to the location when it's stored, or it would, if you do a load, it would take the data 
and put it into a location. So we would load to a label and we would store from the label. So when you do a store, it would look like this. You can do an as ST or an STR. So we can store from our, uh, we can store into R5, from R5 and let's say a label one. Or sometime we would just do like that. So after you load, you have to store. Okay, if you wanted to retrieve your data and in LC3, you can also return. When, when you start learning to write, um, when you're learning to write like functions equivalent, then we, we would be able to return from the function. Okay, so with store result, when you have the result that's added to the destination register, we, can, we need to be able to put the result into a location. Okay, we need to store the instruction and the data is stored to the memory. Otherwise, Nothing stays permanent in register. You don't keep things in register, right? You have to move it in and out. So when you load into the register, you would do something with that. Let's say we wanted to add, we wanted to subtract, multiply, which is add multiple times. Once we have the result, we need to take the result from the register and store it back to a memory location. So at that point, what it's gonna do is it's gonna write the memory address to MIR and the data to MDR, and it's gonna do a write signal to the memory. So that way your data is retained. Otherwise, it will be changed in the next part of the program. Okay. Any question with this? Okay, let's talk about changing sequence, which takes us to the next question. This is when we do control statement in higher languages. So we call this as part of the flow or the control instructions. So in the fetch phase, we, we saw that we increment the PC by one as it would find the next instruction to execute. Now, what if you don't want to execute the next instruction? What if you wanted to move from that part of your program to a later part of your program or an earlier part of your program, right? So it allows us to control how the program is gonna flow. And this, when you look at this is equivalent to C++ where you use if else statement or when you're using loops. So we can do a jump and jumps are unconditional. We can just jump to a label. So let's say I'm writing a program and let's say I'm doing a multiplication. And instead of having it flow to the next instruction, what I can do is I can have it jump down further to the a, a later part of my program and be able to take the result and divide, okay? So I can jump to the division section and be able to operate the division. And then I can jump back to the middle of the program and continue. So jump are unconditional. It just goes to a certain instruction based on what you tell it to do. So it's uh, so what that does is it changes the pointer because it now it needs to point to a different location of memory where it holds a you know the the destination instruction. We would use branch or br and brz brn and br zero or brz brn and brp. And this is when we do loops, okay? 
So the way we do loops in assembly is we can use it to check for zero. When it's not zero, then it's positive or negative. So we can use three type of branch. We can do a regular BR, which doesn't have any conditions, or we can do a BRZ where it would check for zero, or we can do an N for negative, or we can do a BRP for positive, okay? And we will work on this in the next few weeks. So to answer the next question, we would have control instructions being used when we wanted to change sequence in the instructions, or if we don't want the following instructions to be executed. So you need to change the order of your instructions. You would see this when we utilize loops, control statement like if else, we would use jump or branch in LC3. Any question with this? Okay, no question, huh? All right. Okay, last part. So here, real quick before the last part, we, we need to take a look at jump. So for jump, it's 1100. Zero, zero. So when it sees these bits like this, it's gonna know that it's gonna jump, okay? And we need to jump to a base. So if you're using a label, you would say jump, right? We can do a jump, uh, let's say label two. Right, or you can name it anything you want, really. Um, and then what that's going to do is in later in your program, you would have label two, and then you would have some of your code like add r1, one r2, etc. Okay, and then when you finish with this, what it will do is it's going to continue after that, unless you wanted to move the sequence, you wanted to change in the sequence and jump back to earlier in the program. So you can control your program that way. Okay. Question. Okay, so now um, what this will do is it tests load the content of R3 into the PC. If we do this, the example that's shown here, so what it's going to do is it's going to take the pointer and it's going to point to the location of the data that would be for register three. Okay, so in, in the control unit state, we know that as we are moving through the program, here is where we do a PC plus one. But if we jump, what will happen is it, it needs to be able to update the MDR, I'm sorry, the MAR. So it's gonna take the MAR and it's gonna say that it's a new location now instead of the next sequence in in the address and it's gonna need to take the MDR and put it into IR. So it will be able to decode it and move the program into different location of your code or execute different part of your code. So uh, basically when you were saying that the uh, 1100 uh, means jump, like it knows to jump, that's uh those four bits uh, input into the decoder, which then has an output signal to whichever circuit makes it jump. Yes, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Very good. 
So all of this, when even when we write it in assembly, right, it takes it and 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 decode it into the binaries, and then based on that, that's gonna depending on the instruction that we'll be following. Very good. Okay. So we will set up the loop and, and you would see how loop would work, especially we would also do recursion program and assembly down the line. So, um, you know, and with recursion, we have to do a control, a control flow for our program. Okay. So we'll practice some of this so that way you know how to do it. And if you wanted to implement, you know, different things for your project, that will be fine. Okay, so um, the next part is, it talks about if the instructions is not processed from the application, then the processing instructions need to, then it is processing instructions from the operating system. Now, when you reinitialize your machine in the simulator, everything clears out. But when you reinitialize on your machine regularly in a computer, you would see some values, right? Because there's things that are being utilized for operating system purposes. So the OS, if you're looking at the operating system itself, it is a way, it, it has management capability in that it allows the user to interface with the system. Not only that, it's able to manage processor and resources. So when you use task manager in Windows operating system, right, you're able to end task, you're able to look at, you know, memory allocation for certain processes. Um, with that, what we see is that the OS would have the tools, right, for management, your system management capability. Now to stop the computer, what happens with the clock is that we, it's gonna operate an AND logic. So AND is used and the clock generator signal with the zero. So remember that when we AND anything with the zero, it gets a zero. So when you end that, you basically clear or get zero for everything. In that case, the control unit stops seeing the clock signal and it stops processing, okay? Because it uses one clock cycle per instructions. So when you end it with the zero, then what happens is it's gonna stop, it's gonna halt, it's gonna stop processing for that signal. And it would look like this. So we would have a gate and, right, and we would apply that with the clock generator and that will clear, okay. So for the next question, it asks you how can you, how can a computer be stopped from processing? Those are your answer. We would need to end the clock generator signal with zero and when the control unit stops seeing the clock signal, it stops processing. Any questions with this? Um, we're gonna like more, go more in depth in this with the lab, right? Where you actually like show us. Yeah, so I wanna I wanted to come back to to the last lab because there was a lot of confusion with that, and and I wanted to bring because now you have a little bit of knowledge with LC three based on what we talked about with instructions. So let's take a look at that. Okay. Um, also, if you guys wanted to you know, check out the PowerPoint. It gives you additional details on some of the things like clock cycle. And then it talks about, you know, the fetch, the decode and all of that, which I put the majority of it on the notes and also read the chapter. It, it talks about that. So don't forget to read, okay? So all of this were extracted and put in the notes. Um, Let's talk about last lab and, and 
and tying it back to this lecture since I have about 20 something minutes. Okay, so I ended up um, recapturing the program. So, uh, wait, I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't save it all the way. This is the one I'm looking at lab three. I apologize. Okay, so here is the program that you see. And um, you know, you can you can have it where white space is not really a big thing unless you have too much of a gap, then it's not gonna see your register and label accordingly with the source and the destination. So here we are with the last exercise, which is exercise four from the last lab, okay? Now, in this exercise, we started with the origination address. Here is where we load, okay? So we talked about in last week, so this would record the input for the ASCII, as ASCII character, okay? Input and ASCII character. But we wanted to load R3 with hex N3. So we would take, because we need to convert ASCII to hexadecimal. And because LC3, it sees everything in hexadecimal and then eventually binary. So at this point, when we load this, right? See how you do the load instruction here? When you load the instruction here, you load the, the label to the register three. Okay, and when you see that, you need to also look at what is that label used for. So the data section for almost all assembly program is usually located on the bottom, right? Compared to what you would see in C++ or Java, we usually declare our variable, assign it value at the top. So for LC3, you need to declare your data stuff on the bottom. So when I looked at hex N3, I fill it with negative 30 hexadecimal, okay? So this is equivalent to negative 30 hex. And if you're not sure, take, take out your calculator, put in FFB zero, and to see if you're getting a negative hex, okay? So what we're doing here is we're putting that negative 30 hex into register three. And we're gonna take the register three and we're gonna add it with whatever that's in register zero. And what's in register zero is the input from the user, okay? So if I type in a one that's in ASCII and we need to take that ASCII and we need to operate the conversion by subtracting the offset, which is 30, okay? So because when you do an in, it automatically throws that into the first register, which is register zero. And if you subtract 30 from it, see, I put subtract 30 for this part, then what you're doing is you converting that to hex value based on the offset. Then after that, you need to move that from register zero to register one. And the way we move this is we would do an add, okay? Can you do a load? Sure, you can do a load with a copy, but a lot of the times it's easier when we do, we when we copy, we when we move, we would do a copy like this. So what happens is, the input is in register zero, right, originally, and then from the input, you add it with the negative 30 hex, you put it onto register zero, uh, register zero, and then you're gonna take 
whatever is in register zero after the, the negative 30 hex, then you got to transfer it. You're going to move it to register one to free up register zero for the next input. So if you have a ton of input, you have to keep moving it out of register zero. And you can utilize other register subsequently. As long as you track them, you can use register five for all that matters, right? We will talk about how we would use five and six for stack later, but um, so we would, we would move it out of register zero and put it on register one to free it up for the next input. And then again, whatever that's input, then we need to convert it, okay? Just like what we did before, okay? Now, after we convert it, we then can add it because our program is to add two value. One plus one is gonna give you a two, okay? But two in ASCII. So we already convert it to hexadecimal, then we add it, after that, we convert it back to ASCII to show the human, okay? So at this point, we're just operating an add and we need to add from register zero, that was the input after it was converted. And then previous input after it was converted is in register one. And we're gonna put that onto register two, okay? And the rest of this, this is just to output string. We already talked about that last time. Okay. And then for this part, we need to convert it back to ASCII so that way the human can see and we out it. We put, we display some. Okay. So I ended up retyping the program and section it with the comment and making sure the label match up so that way you would see. But as you can see in a program like this, Right, simply when we look at the add, that will be 001 when it decodes it. And then it's gonna, it's gonna for the next part, it's gonna use the MAR and the MDR for the register to be able to obtain the data from the input. So if I strike a number four, right, it's gonna see, it's gonna put that onto register zero and then you know, to properly program it and convert it so you get the right value, we need to operate the hex, the hex subtraction for the offset to convert it to hex. And then from hex, we need to convert it back to ASCII before we output, okay? So now when we stop the program, that simply it's gonna do an and with the, the clock cycle where it's gonna halt and end the program at the end, okay? So if you are running a loop and you wanted to stop the loop, last week, a student, I think Alejandro mentioned, it's kind of like a break, but a break would move it to the next one. So in this, it just stops. So if you wanted to halt, you can halt it, okay? Now, if you wanted to jump, if I wanted to jump this back, I can do a jump here as long as I have a location. So if I'm using a label, you notice that a label, you would fill it with a hex, hex value. So we can fill it with data numbers, right? Or we can fill it with a location. So hex is gonna be used with the fill. So it's gonna say that this is gonna be at a certain location for for the slave move. And we use negative hex value here or a sign value here to represent the negative 30 hex. Okay. So you can fill it with the value or you can just fill it with an address. So you first when I write assembly program, I start with data declaration first on the bottom. And then I started adding stuff to the top after origination. So we'll do some practice this week. So you would do some algebraic expression in assembly, <coughs> x plus y equals something. And then you can check for when it is equal to zero.
Okay. So you saw how this would be illustrated now when we're looking at you know, the processes behind it, how it uses the components right, in the control unit and in the ALU. Question. Okay. And if you have time later on, you know, this week, like today, tomorrow, or tonight, tomorrow, take a look at lab three. Okay. And in lab three, you will see that we are, I wrote some of the, the program were very simple and I'll explain this. We are using label for P and Q and then we're gonna do a subtraction like what we did before, okay? And then we also gonna write assembly program for this expression. But in this, right, I wanted to show you how to do this and I'll do this with you. So that way you know how to be able to check when when you can test it with a certain value okay and then for number three we are going to write an assembly program for this t is equal to a plus b plus c minus nine and we can test it with specific value by doing an input on that okay and i'll show you All right, um, so that kind of preview for the lab and then exercise. So it gradually gets a little harder. So by the time that you get to exercise four, we're gonna do a control, a control instruction. So we're gonna do a branch with the label, okay? So after this week lab, you should be able to understand a little bit more on how to write uh, a simple program from a simple program to more of a, you know, a complex program with the branches to check for positive, negative, or zero. Question. Okay. I think that's it for me today. If you finish with the assignment, please submit it so you don't forget. Uh, check out lab three for Thursday and we'll touch base on Thursday type your name in the chat. Um, and then I try to keep up with your grade and your attendance and all of that throughout the week and by the end of the week. But your grade should be updated. Please see my comments if you didn't receive the grade that you thought you were supposed to get, but, uh, and communicate with me if you have any problems. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, Professor. Bye. I'm stick around good for night. questions. Yes, good night. Any questions?
So for control instructions is, we, we will revisit it for the lab, but you would use it for like loops or if else statement in the case of assembly. Okay. So we would do branch. Um, and also we would do jump. So I'll come back to that on Thursday. Did you need the questions and the answer? Or are you able to find it? Okay, so for the control, if you need to refer to the notes, I'll tell you where that's going to be located. So the last few, the last two questions, you can take a look at um, page, page seven and eight of your notes. Okay. For number 12, let me see. Yeah, so when you want to use the control instruction is when you wanted to change sequence. of execution. And that is when you use loops, conditions like if else. So you would use a jump, JMP or branch, branch negative zero or positive in LC3. Okay. And you can find this also on page seven of your notes. Any question? It's not able to give it to me. Okay, you're welcome. Bye, Ernesto. Good night. Thomas, you have any question?
Okay, Thomas, I'm going to sign off. So if you don't have any questions, I'm going to sign off. So email me if you have questions, okay? Have a good night.